Those that have questions, I encourage you to come to this mic right here. If it gets a little bit long, you can, you can kind of line up right here. And uh, let's, let's go with some of these first couple questions. Any, Dr. Craig, do you have anything that you want to say at the beginning? Only that um, if I don't know the uh, area that the question is about, I'll simply uh, say that this is not something I've worked on and take a pass. Uh, I don't claim to be the Bible answer man, but if there is a question on an area I've worked on, then I'll do my best to try to answer that question. Okay, so who would like to be first? We need someone to break the ice. Yes. And go ahead and line up behind this yeah. fellow so we don't have don't, a time lag in between. I think my question is about the origin of evil. Yes. Um, Christians, you know, believe that real live evil exists. That, yes. That it, it's true. There really is evil in the yes. world. We don't believe God is evil. Right. Um, and we believe that at some point he is all there was. Yes. So it becomes a conundrum to explain to people who aren't Christians how we got to this state if God's not the author of evil. If he didn't create evil, and he's not evil, and evil does exist, I didn't know if you had some thoughts about the origin yes. of that evil. Yes, I see the origin of evil in a disorder in the free will of creatures. God has created creatures with a free will, uh, angels and humans, and these wills are properly oriented toward God as the supreme good. When creatures use their free will to direct them toward other goods rather than toward God as the ultimate good, this is a disorder in the creaturely will and is the origin of evil. Um, so moral evil is a result of creaturely freedom and is a disorder in the creaturely will. Um, now, one might say in addition to that, that evil doesn't have any sort of positive ontological status. That is to say, evil isn't a thing that exists and needs to be created by God. It's a privation of something. It's a privation of right order in the creaturely will. And to illustrate, think in physics, um, Cold is a privation of heat. Cold doesn't have any positive ontological status. There isn't any thing called cold. Rather, it's an absence of heat. So cold is a privation of heat. Now, that doesn't mean, obviously, that cold is illusory. If you go outside on a winter's day, you can feel how real this privation is but it's not a positive reality that would need to be created by God. And in exactly the same way, evil doesn't have any positive ontological status. It's a privation of right order in the creaturely will that is due to freedom. Yes. Yes, I teach mechanical engineering at Bradley University, and I ask uh, questions of my students of the cause of disorder and then uh, they'll all agree that disorder is caused by man. Even the religion professors at Bradley will agree with that. But then when I ask the next question is, do we live in an isolated system, they go agnostic. And so how would you, how would you engage an agnostic when you start answering the questions of the existence of God and um, how, oh. do you, how do you get them engaged Right. In that discussion, because right. they go, it's not humanly possible for us to answer that question. I would encourage every Christian to have a list of arguments memorized that he can share with an unbeliever. The typical unbeliever, in my experience, has no good reason for his unbelief. He's simply been taught to repeat the slogan, there's no good evidence for God's existence. And this is really, I think, a mask for intellectual laziness on his part, but it serves very effectively as a conversation stopper because the average Christian doesn't have any good evidence for God's existence. And so this, in effect, uh, gives the atheist the trump card. There's no evidence for God's existence, and that's the end of the conversation. 
But if you will have a list of arguments memorized at that point, what you can do is say to the unbeliever with a surprised look on your face, well, is that what you think? Why, I can think of at least five arguments for God's existence. And at that point, he's got to say, yeah, like what? And then you're off and running. So when people ask me, well, there's no evidence for God's existence, and I say, well, sure there is. And they, they say, well, like what? I typically just list about five arguments. I'll say, God is the best explanation for why anything at all exists rather than nothing. God is the best explanation of the beginning of the universe. God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. God is the best explanation of objective moral values and duties in the world. God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning Jesus of Nazareth. And finally, God can be personally known and experienced. And I find that many times just giving a list of the arguments is enough to satisfy the unbeliever. He doesn't even ask to hear the arguments. Just hearing a list of them is often enough. So I would encourage all of us to have such a list memorized that you can just share at the drop of a hat with an unbeliever. Now, if he does want to press you, each one of those points in the list has an argument that has premises or steps that you can memorize and again then share with them. For example, the argument uh, that God is the best explanation for the beginning of the universe is very easy to memorize. It has just three steps. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And that will show that we don't live in an isolated system, that there is a transcendent cause beyond space and time, beyond the universe that has brought the universe into being, which has obvious theological implications. So if you have these premises memorized, then you are prepared to actually share the argument with the unbeliever. But in many cases, you won't even need to do that if you just have a list. Yes, Steve. Good morning, Bill. Welcome to Peoria again. I have a question for you. There's a great migration going on in the world of Muslims from closed countries into Western Europe, into the United States. I know you've worked in Muslim countries before. What do you believe is the best way to share your faith with those that are coming from a Muslim background? In sharing our faith with Muslims, which I really enjoy, I, I love talking with Muslims, I think that the key is to focus on Jesus of Nazareth, his identity and his claims. Don't criticize Muhammad. Don't get their backs up by attacking their prophet. Uh, I wouldn't even quibble about the Quran and errors in the Quran uh, versus the Bible. Focus on Jesus. You know, Paul says that Jesus is the stumbling stone. He's the stumbling stone for both Jews and for Gentiles. And it's the same with Muslims. It is who Jesus was and what he claimed that divides Islam fundamentally from Christianity. And here, I, I, the, the, the evidence is just all on the Christian side. I mean, the one indisputable fact about Jesus of Nazareth that is recognized by every historical scholar is that Jesus died by crucifixion at the hands of the Romans. And yet, this is the one historical fact about Jesus that the Quran denies. The Muslim does not believe that Jesus was crucified. In the Quran, it says they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him, but it was only made to appear to them so. And so, this just makes the Quran historically indefensible. And in my experience, sharing your faith with a Muslim is very much like sharing your faith with a Jehovah's Witness. It will be the same verses, the same passages that you will use because the Jehovah's Witness also denies that Jesus is the Son of God, denies the deity of Christ, and so you'll share passages with the Jehovah's Witness that shows that Jesus made claims whereby he put himself in the place of God 
himself. And then also you've got the evidence for the crucifixion and the resurrection. And I think this pre presents a very, very powerful case for thinking that the Christian view of Jesus is correct in contrast to the Muslim view. And it puts the focus where it should be. It puts the focus on Jesus. Yes. Um, working with college students, uh, a good bit of college students would say, you know, that's, that's true for you, but that's not true for me. Just the relative, how would you address that kind of, what kind of conversation would you have with a student who really believes yeah. in relativism? I guess I would begin to press that student about whether he doesn't think that there are any objective truths. Because if he thinks that, that statement is self-refuting. Is it objectively true that there are no objective truths? Or is it that just your opinion? If it's just your opinion, then I don't have any reason to pay any attention to it or agree with it. But if it is objectively true that there are no objective truths, then that's self-refuting. It, it shows that his position is indefensible. So that kind of blanket relativism is, is simply indefensible. It, it refutes itself. So he must be holding to some sort of more restricted view where he does believe certain things are objectively true, like for example that I have a head or that I live say in Peoria or, or something of that sort. And so you got to kind of just dialogue with him as to what he does think is objectively true and then share with him these arguments for the existence of God that are based on truths of science and history that are generally accepted. And if he's going to reject those, then he's going to, and I think you need to show him this, he's going to isolate himself into a radical minority that flies in the face of what most scientists and historians believe. And why would anyone want to do that? Make the non-Christian feel intellectually isolated and separated from mainstream thought. For example, that the universe originated finite time ago in the Big Bang, or that Jesus of Nazareth was a first century Palestinian Jew who died by crucifixion. These are generally accepted facts um, that are not unique to Christians. And if, he has, if he's skeptical about these, he needs to give some good reason as to why the majority of scientists and scholars are wrong about these things. Dr. Craig, I have several pre-submitted questions. I'm just gonna bring one right now. Are scriptures 100% valid? We have a complex answer we give people. We'd love to hear if you have a simple and short answer. Are scriptures 100% valid? Well, the short answer would be yes. Um, do you have a medium length answer? <laughs> <laughs> Let me say this about that. I don't argue with a non-believer about biblical inspiration and inerrancy. My goal as an evangelist is to set the bar as low as possible to get him into the kingdom. I want to put as few obstacles in his way in order to get him saved. And so I don't try to convince the unbeliever of biblical inerrancy or 100% reliability. Uh, I'm quite willing to say these documents could be uh, erroneous in many respects. There could be inconsistencies and contradictions, but nevertheless, they are historically reliable with respect to, for example, the four facts that I shared last night, which are sufficient for belief in the resurrection of Jesus. And if that's right, then you should become a Christian. And then the question of biblical inerrancy, scriptural reliability, that becomes an in-house question among believers. So I would really encourage you, at least in doing evangelism, don't try to set the bar so high that in order to be saved, the unbeliever has to come to believe in biblical inspiration and inerrancy. That, that's simply um, not necessary in, for, in order for him to become a Christian. Uh, an atheist uh, was given a New Testament, and I'm the one who gave it to him. He read the New Testament, and being a scholar himself, 
he said, uh, there's something about the New Testament that confuses me. He said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John quote Jesus Christ. And then the epistles and the other letters do not quote their follower. Why is it that the epistles and the other letters of the New Testament do not quote and say Jesus said this? Right. Okay, so the question was, why is it that when you read the epistles of the New Testament, for example, the letters of Paul, you don't have Paul quoting Jesus of Nazareth all the time, whereas you do have this in the Gospels. Well, I think the answer to that is that the Gospels are biographies of Jesus, and so naturally they tell the story of Jesus' life and his teachings, so naturally they quote him. By contrast, the epistles are what we call occasional letters. That is to say, they were written on specific occasions to address specific issues that were burning in those churches. For example, the premier example of this would be the letter of Philemon, where Paul is writing to his friend to let Onesimus, this runaway slave, go. And it's a very personal letter. There, there is, it's clearly just an occasional letter between Paul and this other person about this specific concern. And even in place like Corinth, uh, Paul addresses issues like meat offered to idols, uh, people were getting drunk at the communion table, how do you use spiritual gifts and corporate worship. Paul is addressing all of these very specific concerns in these letters and not trying to give a sort of biographical account of Jesus. But in fact, if you do read the letters of Paul, you will find he does quote Jesus on several occasions. And even more than that, there are lots of allusions to Jesus' teachings uh, in Paul's letters where he's paraphrasing Jesus. A great example of this is where Paul says, um, now concerning the married, he says, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my opinion as one who by the Lord's grace is trustworthy. Now he's not saying there, I have not been inspired by the Lord to give this comment. I don't have any sort of inspiration from God and so I'm just giving my view. He's saying, I don't have any tradition from the historical Jesus to share about this. I don't have something I can quote from Jesus about this, but as an apostle commissioned by him, I'm going to give you my authoritative view as an apostle of Christ. And that's a perfect example, I think, of where Paul is in touch with the Jesus tradition, but in this case he said, I don't have anything from the Lord about this, and so I'm going to give my view. By contrast, when he addresses in 1 Corinthians 11 the problems at the communion table, there he does say, um, on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. And he quotes the Jesus tradition. There he's got Jesus tradition. And what is especially significant about that you notice Paul, in quoting the words of institution about the body and the blood, is he says, on the night that he was betrayed. This shows that Paul knew the historical context of the traditions that he handed on. He didn't just have the story of the Last Supper. He knew it was on the night of Judas' betrayal of Jesus. So we see there that Paul understood the wider context of the traditions that he handed on and delivered and, and knew the wider Jesus story. Um, so only the tip of the iceberg is in view in the epistles and Paul will quote from or allude to the teachings of Jesus only insofar as they impinge upon the occasions that prompted him to write the letter to these people. But Many New Testament scholars have called Paul's epistles a fifth gospel because precisely of his allusions and quotations to Jesus. Don't be shy about coming up, everybody. Yeah, come but I do on have up some and stand in line. Come stand behind me. I have a few pre submitted questions. When you read about ISIS slaughtering Christian children, women, et cetera, in the Middle East, it sounds a lot like what God told Joshua to do in the Promised Land. How can Christians be outraged by ISIS? 
and yet worship the God who sent Joshua to do his own version of ethnic okay. cleansing? This is a very agonizing question that any believer in biblical authority faces. And I've written on this on our website in question of the week number 16, and then I revisit it again, I believe, in question of the week 238. And so if you want a fuller development of this issue, I, I would suggest you look at question 16 and question 238. Let me just say this. There is a world of difference between the judgment upon Canaan that God commanded and the Islamic idea of jihad. Jihad is a religious war. It is the use of violence to convert people to the religion of Islam. Um, if the people that you're having jihad against repent and become Muslims, then you're not to kill them anymore because now they're Muslims. It is a use of violence in the propagation of the Islamic faith. It is a tool of evangelism, in effect. That is completely different than the invasion of Canaan in the Old Testament. That was an example of God's judgment upon these corrupt Canaanite tribes that were inhabiting the land of Canaan at that time. You remember God allowed Israel to languish for 400 years in Egypt, in slavery, before he brought them out because he said the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. God waited until these Canaanite tribes were so evil, so reprobate, that they were ripe for judgment. And then he delivered the land over to Israel and he used the armies of Israel as a tool of judgment, as a means of bringing judgment on them. But it wasn't a religious war. It wasn't an attempt to convert these people to Judaism. It wasn't a means of spreading Judaism. So it, it's a world of difference. God was judging the nations of Canaan in the same way that he would later judge Israel when he allowed the armies of Babylon to come in and destroy Israel and uh, take its people into exile. So there's a, a world of difference between what ISIS and other jihadists are doing and the sort of judgment that God brought upon Canaan and then later brought upon Israel itself. Now, that leaves a host of questions uh, still unanswered, but I would refer you at least to those questions that I've written, and I think this does help us to see that there is an enormous difference between using war and violence as a tool of evangelism and the kind of judgment that God brought upon the Canaanite tribes and then later upon Israel itself. Yes. Yes, I have a question about extra biblical evidence for the post-mortem appearances of Jesus, mm -hmm. um, if, if you have any. Any references that we have to Jesus resurrection appearances that are not in the New Testament documents tend by their very nature to be later and derivative and therefore less valuable. These are sources that already know the Gospels, you see, and so they're not independent. And as I explained last night, what you're looking for is early independent sources of confirmation. And these references outside the documents of the New Testament are derivative and later, and therefore they're not really important or valuable for the historian. Now, interestingly enough, there is, in a sense, extra biblical evidence for these appearances, but it's not in the sources later than the New Testament. It's in the sources earlier than the New Testament that the New Testament writers used in writing their documents. So last night I explained that in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul is not writing in his own hand. He is quoting from an old formula that probably goes back to within the first five years after Jesus' crucifixion. So this is a, an extra Pauline 
source. You can't say, well, this material comes from Paul in A.D. 55 when he wrote to the Corinthians. No, no, this is a quotation of an extra New Testamental source that goes back to within the first five years after the crucifixion. Similarly, I showed that in writing the story of Jesus' passion, Mark was not writing freehand. He was using this early pre-Markan passion source that probably also goes back to within the first decade after Jesus' crucifixion. So one of the most important new developments in New Testament scholarship is the identification of these sources that the New Testament writers themselves used. And so that's where the really important, quote unquote, extra biblical material is to be found. Not in these later derivative secondary sources that know the Gospels, but rather in the pre-New Testament sources used by Matthew and Luke and Paul and Mark. And when you get to those early sources, and especially if they're independent, you see, then you're really, you've hit historical pay dirt. Yes. Thank you so much for being here. Sure. Um, so I have a question, uh, I guess not a factual question or a question about your work, uh, more of a personal question regarding your work. Good. Uh, do you consider apologetics, actually let me back up. Christians often say that our religion is about a relationship with God or a relationship with Jesus through the Holy Spirit. Do you find that your work is part of that relationship or outside of that relationship? So what's the interplay there? And what have okay. been benefits and possible um, hurdles that you've had to overcome in that interplay? Right. I think that uh, the question was, what is the relationship between the discipline of apologetics and the personal relationship that one has with God or with Jesus Christ? And, is there a tension here? How do we relate these? This really is an age-old question about the relationship between faith and reason, I think. And here I have found it very helpful to make a fundamental distinction between knowing Christianity to be true and showing Christianity to be true. I think that the fundamental way in which I know Christianity is true is not through argument and evidence, but it is through that personal relationship with God made possible by the Holy Spirit. Paul says when we cry, Abba, Father, the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And so I think that the fundamental way in which we know Christianity is true is through the inner witness of the Holy Spirit. And this is available to every Christian at every place and every time in history. So that those who live in times and places where, say, they have no library resources, they may be illiterate, they don't have the leisure time to study the evidence for the resurrection, they can know and know with confidence that Christ is risen from the dead simply on the basis of the inner witness of God's Holy Spirit to their heart. That's how we know Christianity to be true, and that then is confirmed by evidence and arguments. When it comes to showing Christianity to be true, though, there we're concerned, how do we prove to another person that what we know is true? And this will involve giving arguments and evidence to the unbeliever in order to show him that Christianity is true. But even here, it's not done apart from the Holy Spirit. Rather, you present these arguments and evidence, trusting the Holy Spirit to use them as you lovingly present them to draw the unbeliever to Christ. So in both knowing and showing Christianity to be true, both the Holy Spirit and reason and evidence are at play, but the emphasis is rather reversed in those two areas. Hey, Dr. Craig. Hello. Um, question about the passage in Matthew where it talks about the dead 
rising to life. And there's been some debate whether that impugns inerrancy. Just wanted to get your take on that and what you thought about that right. passage. The passage that the gentleman is referring to is in the Gospel of Matthew, where at the time of the crucifixion of Jesus, the rocks are rent, uh, and it says that some of the Old Testament saints were raised from the dead. Uh, and then after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the city and appeared to many. Now, everybody has difficulty with this passage because we believe what Paul says that Jesus Christ is the first fruits of the resurrection. He's the one who was raised from the dead first. So how is it that there are these Old Testament saints that seem to have been raised first at the time of the crucifixion rather than following Jesus' resurrection? And what were they doing between the time of the crucifixion and the resurrection when they went into the city and were seen by many? Were they sort of sitting around in the tombs waiting to come out? You know, I mean, this seems bizarre. So. This is a problem for everybody, how to understand these passages. And it's been suggested by some that the, this passage isn't meant to be taken literally. Rather, this is part of what is called apocalyptic imagery used by Matthew. Apocalyptic Jewish literature is literature that uses symbols and figures to convey deep theological truths. And the greatest example of this is the book of Revelation. I mean, nobody interprets a book of Revelation literally to mean that there's going to be nine-headed sea monsters that are crawling up out of the ocean and trying to take over the world like Godzilla. These are symbols of nation states and forces opposing uh, Israel and, and God's people. So. Revelation is a great example of apocalyptic literature that is full of symbolism and figure. And so the suggestion is perhaps this is what Matthew is doing in order to emphasize the earth-shattering significance of Jesus' death that he has the rocks rent and the Old Testament saints are raised and this is just part of the imagery to say that this event of Jesus' crucifixion was of earth-shaking significance. Now, is that the correct interpretation of the passage? I don't know. Um, I am open-minded about this. I am open to construing the passage that way, um, but I'm not sure that that's right. It may well be that uh, Matthew was in touch with traditions of people who had seen appearances of people in the city following Jesus' resurrection, that, that's not implausible. It may have been that these people weren't raised to glory and immortality, but perhaps just resuscitated the way Lazarus was, but Lazarus would die again. It wasn't as though he was the first fruits of the resurrection in the way Jesus did was. So I, I don't know. I, I, everyone is puzzled by the, this passage, and I just I have an open mind. I'm, I'm uh, uh, willing to be convinced, uh, but I have no firm opinion on it. I feel like the, a good bit of the people I have conversation with are just simply not interested spiritually. Yeah. Um, what kind of conversations would you have with them to generate spiritual interest? This is a huge problem, isn't it? The, the biggest problem that we face today is not opposition, it's apathy. And some people even talk about apatheism uh, as one of the problems that we face. Uh, there's theism, there's atheism, but then there's just apatheism, which is you don't care if God exists. Well, my best shot um, at trying to jar people out of their apathy is what I call the absurdity of life without God. And what I try to do is draw upon the insights of atheistic existentialist writers themselves to show that if God does not exist, then life is ultimately absurd. And I analyze that in terms of life having no ultimate meaning, no ultimate value, and no ultimate purpose. And this leads to a very, very grim 
view of life, it, it leads to despair. In fact, I think it is a view that is so filled with the despair that it's impossible, I argue, to live consistently and happily within the framework of such a, an atheistic worldview. If the atheist lives consistently, he would be profoundly unhappy, in despair, deeply depressed. If he manages to live happily, as most do, it's only because they do not carry out their worldview to its logical conclusion, but live as though their lives were meaningful, valuable, and purposeful, even though they have no basis for it. And then I'll say to the non-believer, given the unlivability of atheism, shouldn't you go back to square one and say, well, maybe atheism isn't right after all. Maybe there really is a God. And if that's true, that means that life does have value, meaning, and purpose, and you can live consistently and happily within the framework of such a worldview. So that's my best shot. Um, and if, if that doesn't jar them or budge them, then I think there's probably nothing left but prayer. Uh, just to pray for that person that God will awaken him. I think that for single people, when they get married and start to have children, this is when reality hits because you're faced with the question, what am I going to teach my children about moral values? Are there really moral values or really is everything permitted? There really is no right and wrong, good and evil. And that's pretty tough to raise kids with that sort of nihilistic view. So this may come home to roost later on. Um, give time for the seed to be watered and to sprout. Yeah, no ultimate meaning. That is to say, there's no ultimate significance to life. No ultimate value. There is no ultimate right or wrong, good or evil. Everything's relative. And then the third was no ultimate purpose. There's no goal of life for which you exist. Everything just ends in death for every individual and in the heat death of the universe for mankind as a whole. This is laid out in my books, On Guard, which is a kind of beginner book for those wanting to get into apologetics for the first time, and then also in the book Reasonable Faith, which is a more advanced uh, book, a more intermediate level book. Yes? I was going to refer back to the question on the validity of Scripture. Mm -hmm. You state, I appreciate your comment on how it's really not necessary for salvation. But for the new believer or for any believer, how would you, how would you answer that question? All right, good and, question. Suppose someone is a Christian and now wants to know how should I regard the Bible. I think that the key is to look at how Jesus of Nazareth regarded the Old Testament. Jesus is our Lord, and as his disciples, we follow what he taught. And when you look at Jesus' attitude toward the Old Testament, he taught and believed that the Old Testament was the Word of God and that it was reliable and to be believed and followed. And I think that gives grounds then for believing that in fact the Bible is inspired by God and therefore trustworthy and true in everything that it teaches. Um, so it's been rightly said, I think, we do not believe in Christ because we believe in the Bible. We believe in the Bible because we believe in Christ. And that would be the way in which I would justify belief in inspiration and inerrancy. Yes? Like a few minutes ago, you mentioned Revelation briefly, and I was wondering what your thoughts were on how close to that point in time we were. All right, the question was, how close in time are we to the return of Christ? Um, I don't see any reason to think that we're very close. It seems to me that the sort of signs that Jesus talked about in his Olivet Discourse about wars and rumors of wars and famines and nation rising against nation and so forth, he says these are just the beginning of birth pangs. The end is not yet. And I don't see any reason to think that we're near the end, that we're not 
at the beginning of birth pangs still. Um, the task of world evangelization needs to be completed first, and that still needs to be done. I mean, that's what this conference is about. So I think that while every Christian needs to be prepared for Christ to return at any moment within his lifetime, I'm not one who is anxiously watching the signs of the times and thinking that the end is near. Following up on apathyism, uh -huh. pluralism is the line of questioning here. Right. And uh, following on with what you had said earlier, this takes me back to 25 years ago and being in Japan and taking a tour of the city and listening to the tour guide say that the majority of the Japanese follow the Shinto religion yes. and the majority of the Japanese follow the Buddhism and the majority follow <laughs> Christianity. And I was dumbfounded, <laughs> looked at my hosts who were taking me around the city. And uh, Abisan looked at me and smiled and said, well, we practice them all because one must be right. <laughs> and, and, and I didn't have any idea at a young man then how to address that, that if you believe in everything, you believe in nothing. Right. But it wasn't just a quick comment, because for the next couple of weeks, they took me to a Shinto fire walking and a sh uh, Buddhist temple and showed me that it was no problem in practicing all these different religions in their view. Mm -hmm. So with pluralism, again, that was 25 years ago, yeah. I'd be oh. interested in your thoughts how to address someone that truly does believe that you can believe in anything. Right. The question is about religious pluralism, and I think this is the burning theological issue of our day. Now, there are two kinds of religious pluralism. One is what one might call a naive pluralism, and then the other one is sophisticated pluralism. The naive pluralist says, well, all religions are true. They're basically all just saying the same thing. They're all right. This is naive because anybody who studied the world's religions knows that that cannot be correct because these religions are mutually contradictory. Take, for example, Islam and Buddhism. Islam believes that there is a personal, transcendent creator of the world who is omniscient, morally perfect, holy, and before whom we stand guilty and in need of forgiveness. It believes that if we believe in him and his prophet and perform righteous deeds, we will be saved. Otherwise, we will go into eternal hell. The Buddhist believes none of these things. The Buddhist believes that ultimate reality is impersonal, not personal, uh, that there is no creator, there is no personal immortality after death. Uh, indeed, there is no self that endures through time. And the concept of sin and salvation plays no role whatsoever in this religion. So it's simply impossible that both Islam and Buddhism could both be true. Um, they could both be false. Maybe it's the Hindus who are right, but they can't both be true. So this naive pluralism is, I think, untenable. The sophisticated pluralist today says all of these religions are faults. The ultimate reality is beyond description, beyond characterization, and all of the world's religions picture this ultimate reality in different ways that are appropriate to their culture and society, but they're all literally false. None of these religions is really true. They are all different ways of misrepresenting ultimate reality, but they are effective in transforming people's lives um, from being self-centered and evil to making them into good people. And so all of these religions work in helping to change people's lives. And this is the sort of pluralism that's propagated today by religious studies professors and people who are sophisticated pluralists. What might, might we say to that? Well, I think it's very obvious that a person who has a good apologetic case for Christianity uh, will simply disagree with the pluralist that all of these views are equally false, that 
there are good reasons to think that the Christian worldview is true. And here you will present your arguments for a transcendent creator and designer of the universe who is a personally embodied good and for the person of Jesus of Nazareth, his radical personal claims whereby he put himself in God's place and then the historical evidence for his resurrection from the dead. Uh, and so if your apologetic case goes through, you've refuted pluralism. The, the typical pluralist just assumes that there are no good reasons to think any of these religions are true. And what we need to do is simply challenge that assumption. Mm -hmm. Hi, so one question I have had face to me is um, if I believe that God sends people to hell for not, you know, for not believing in him, kind of two parts, how, is, how does a good God do that? And then also, how do I have, find joy in salvation if that's my belief, if I have friends and relatives that yes. I know have died who have rejected yes. that belief. Both of these are, again, very agonizing questions. I've addressed these on my website at some length. If you look at reasonablefaith.org, there are articles precisely on this question of Christian particularism. How is it that salvation can only be through Christ and those who are separated from Christ, go into an eternity separated from God. I think that the first question is answered by saying that um, hell is an expression of the holiness and the justice of God. That this is, in fact, what we deserve by separating ourselves from him. I don't think it's God's will that anybody go to hell. Uh, the Bible says God is not willing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance. And the only reason that God's will is not done is because people freely and irrevocably separate themselves from God forever. They are like the drowning man who pushes away the lifesaver again and again that is thrown to him to rescue him from drowning. Uh, and this is the penalty or the, the deserts of sin that is justly administered by God. Notice that nobody ever asks a question, the parallel question, how could a just God send people to heaven? Now, as a purely intellectual problem, that's every bit as difficult as how a good God could send people to hell. How can a God who is perfectly just send anybody to heaven given their sin? that they have committed, the guilt they have? Well, the answer, of course, is to be found in Jesus. In Jesus, the love and the justice of God meet. We see the love of God as he dies in our place to reconcile us to him, but we see the justice of God as God's wrath and just punishment for sin is poured out upon Jesus himself. And so the reconciliation of God's love and justice, I think, is found in the person of Christ. And anyone who gives his life to Christ as his Lord and his Savior then benefits from Christ's death. But those who separate themselves from Christ by rejecting him fall back under God's justice. And we know what you deserve there. So I see hell as an expression of the holiness and the justice of God, which people sadly choose for themselves rather than trusting in the provision that God has made in Christ. Now, the second question was how can we rejoice in knowing that family members or loved ones are in hell, separated from God forever? Well, we don't know the answer to that, but here's, here's a possibility. It may be that when we go to be with Christ, that the experience of being in the very presence of Christ without the alloy of sin or the, the veil of sin that separates us from him now will be so beautiful, so overwhelming, 
that it will just preoccupy our minds so that there would be no consciousness of those who are lost and are in hell. Um, think for some uh, example of someone who is undergoing, uh, say during the Civil War, a leg amputation. The pain is so overwhelming that he's not thinking of, say, the multiplication table, which he knows. He knows the, the facts of multiplication, but he's not thinking of them at that moment because the experience of pain just overwhelms him. Now, in exactly the same way, the vision of Christ, I think, is possibly so beautiful, so overwhelming, that it will simply drive from consciousness any knowledge that one might have that there are loved ones that are separated from him and, and lost forever. That knowledge would be privileged to God alone, and it would be God alone who would bear that heavy burden in his heart of knowing that there are people that he loves who have rejected him and are separated from him forever. But it may well be the case that we will not have to bear that burden ourselves. Now, I don't know if that answer is true, but it seems to me that that is a plausible answer and that therefore is a satisfactory answer to this question. Do you want to follow up on that? Well, I think the only thing was um, that question when it was posed to me was more today, where's the joy of my salvation, oh. knowing, knowing oh. that oh. this belief. Well, I, I mean, yeah. if I just speak personally, I don't think that's a problem at all because one is still hoping for their salvation as well. You rejoice in the forgiveness and the love that God has lavished on you. And though your heart aches for those who don't know him yet, you pray for them, you share with them, always in hope that they may yet come to Christ and know this same joy. Dr. Craig, I'd first like to say it is a blessing to have you here. Uh, because it wasn't more than a month ago that I w saw a debate between you and a Dr. Keith Parsons, who oh, uh -huh. is an atheist, and my heart really went out for him. I think the yeah. title of it said, Atheist versus Christian, Christian wins. <laughs> but uh, my question to you is, has any atheist or anyone of any other religious belief that you have debated in the past ever came to Christianity and let you know about it? No. Um, the person who claimed closest was Antony Flew. Antony Flew was perhaps the greatest philosophical atheist of the 20th century. Um, he was active from 1948 until the end of the century and wrote extensively uh, on atheism. And near the end of his life, Flew became persuaded by the arguments for design uh, that this couldn't be the result of chance and therefore came to believe in God, um, that there is a transcendent designer of the universe. Now, he did not become a Christian, so far as I know, unless on his deathbed, Perhaps he took that final step, and we can hope that he did. But he did come to believe in God as a result of the evidence for design in the universe. And it was interesting to see the reaction in the atheist community when he did this. They reviled him. They said this was due to senility and old age and just uh, uh, really insulted him. And Flew said, why are they doing this? I simply did what I have done my entire life. I followed the evidence where it led. And he believed it led to Christ, or, I mean to, to God. Now, I, I, I want to make clear that the purpose of the debates that I do engage in is not to convince the other person. Um, anyone who would get up in front of hundreds and even thousands of people and denounce God and Christ is not apt to become a Christian or change his mind in the course of that debate. Um, the purpose is to reach the students in the audience whose 
minds are still open and who are searching and seeking. And so the target in these debates is not my opponent, it's the students in the audience. And there, uh, it has been very gratifying to see people coming to faith or coming back to faith as a result of seeing these debates. Mm -hmm. uh, Flew wrote a very nice short book that I would recommend. Uh, following up on Jana's question, I, I think maybe it was also uh, we have loved ones who, uh, to our knowledge, did not accept Christ. And I wondered if your answer meant that we can't know for certain what anyone did on their death deathbed. So there's always some hope. Sure, that wasn't my answer, Sam, uh, but that certainly is true. And that we can always hope that those that we love made a last minute decision to turn to Christ. So I have a, I have a Muslim friend that um, he, he, uh, he doesn't have, like, he, he sees our assurance of faith as a, a lack of motivation to do good works. Um, and so he sees that his, like, his, his non-assurance and not knowing if he's going to make it to heaven or not as more motivation to do good. And so he doesn't understand why we even bother. Um, and so I tried to point him to what we call special grace, you know, like in the fact that we have gratitude for what God has done for us in Christ. Um, but he responded to that by what we call common grace and saying, well, I'm thankful for all the good things God has given to me. Um, and so why isn't that enough? I guess yeah. I don't know what your thoughts would be. His claim that people who have assurance of salvation are not motivated to do good works is just demonstrably and empirically false. He should come to a conference like this and listen to the stories of what the people that are supported by this church are involved in. We heard last night about the sort of humanitarian efforts that are going on in places like the Ukraine and other countries to help war-torn countries or in the Middle East with Syrian refugees and so forth. And historically, Christians have been at the forefront of the founding of hospitals and um, leper colonies and uh, bringing clean water and health care and education, uplifting the status of women. Uh, it's just demonstrably false that people who have a firm assurance of the truth of their faith are not actively involved in humanitarian projects. So um, I, I feel frankly sad for him that he would not have an assurance I'm glad he's happy for the common grace that he experiences, but he shouldn't think that if he has assurance of his faith, that then he wouldn't be motivated to do good humanitarian works um, in the name of Christ. That just is utterly contrary to what the Christian church does. Yes. My question is that if a person has never ever been exposed to the gospel, mm -hmm. has never heard anyone go and give them the gospel, and they die without hearing the gospel even once, without hearing the name of Jesus, saves them and died for them, how would God judge them? Okay, the question here is, how does God judge people who have never heard the gospel of Christ? And I think that the Bible indicates that God judges people on the basis of the information that they have. He judges them on the basis of the light that they have. Um, so that those who have never heard of Christ will not be judged on the basis of whether they've placed their faith in Christ. That would be manifestly unfair. They've never heard of Jesus, so how could they place their faith in him? Rather, Paul says in Romans 1 and 2, that they will be judged on the basis of how they've responded to God's general revelation in nature and in conscience. Paul says, in nature, all men at any time in history, any place in the world, can know that there is an eternal and powerful deity who has created the world. And in chapter two he says, that God's moral law is written on the hearts of all people, even those who do not have 
the Old Testament law so that we do by nature what the law requires. We have an instinctual grasp of right and wrong. And so those who um, have never heard the gospel will be judged on the basis of their response to God's general revelation in nature and conscience. Now that does not mean that someone can be saved apart from the work of Christ. What it would mean is that the benefits of Christ's death could be applied to someone without his conscious knowledge of Christ. If he were to look out at the world and say, I know there's a God who's created all this, look in at his own heart and say, I, I don't live up to the demands of God's moral law, and he flings himself on the mercy of this God, uh, asking for forgiveness and pleading for mercy and grace, um, that person would be saved by grace through the blood of Christ, even if he had no knowledge of Christ. He would be like people in the Old Testament who had no conscious knowledge of Christ at all, but they responded to the light that they had and were judged by their response to that light. Now, this raises all sorts of questions. Are there any people like this? Uh, I hope so. I hope Aristotle gets in. Um, but if you take Romans 1 seriously, I think you have to say there's not very many people like this. Paul says that rather than worship and serve the Creator, people turn to gods of their own making and turn away from God. And rather than live up to his moral law, they plunge themselves into immorality and degeneracy and so find themselves condemned before God just on the basis of his general revelation in nature and conscience. So, I don't think we can be optimistic that very many people will access salvation through general revelation, but nevertheless, I think it is possible that, that it, it is, salvation is available to them if they will respond in an appropriate way, and God will judge them fairly and justly because that is God's very nature. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, so, when you were in these debates, um, the people that you go up against, do you, do you think that what you say can have a spiritual effect on them? Because obviously if they're debating against you, they already have yeah. um, knowledge on the Bible or other biblical influences. Yeah. So when you talk to them, does, do you think that it affects them more and that um, God can work through you in um, delivering the word yeah. to them? The question was, when we engage in these debates, do I think that God can use what I share in the lives of my opponents. I suppose he can, I hope that he will, but there's very little evidence of that happening. As I say, these atheists are resolutely opposed to God. They, some of them hate God, and so hearing arguments in a debate with me isn't apt to make much difference in their lives. But one can always pray and hope that it will. Um, but so far, at least, there's not much evidence of that. But as I say, that's not my target audience. Uh, I'm having these events to reach the students in the audience, not my opponent. He's simply there to draw a crowd. Uh, Jonah was in the fish tummy for three days and three nights, and uh, I wanted to know uh, Jesus. Uh, uh, it, in Matthew, it says that uh, Jesus was also three days and three nights, and then we celebrate Easter and Sunday, and there is no that much gap in between. Okay, now because of your accent, I didn't understand clearly the question. Was was the question about Jesus? Being in the earth for three days and three nights yeah. compared to Jonah being yeah. in the belly of the fish for three days and three nights? Yes. Okay. Um, obviously, there were not three days and three nights between Friday and Sunday morning when Jesus rose from the dead. 
But I don't think that that's of much significance because this is an idiom in Jewish uh, language that is variously expressed. Sometimes it will say Jesus rose after three days. More often it will say Jesus rose on the third day. And in Jewish reckoning, the day begins at sundown at six o'clock. So if Jesus was placed in the tomb on Friday afternoon before six, and then he was in the grave on Saturday, and then rose sometime after 6 p.m. on Saturday or Sunday morning, that is on the third day, according to, to Jewish reckoning. Uh, indeed, if Jesus were interred at 4 o'clock on Friday and raised at 7 o'clock Saturday night, the Jew would say he was raised on the third day. And so all of these expressions are just Jewish idioms that are drawn from the Old Testament expressing um, the time of Jesus' resurrection. And I think it probably is an indirect reference to the time of the women's visit. It was on the third day after the crucifixion that the women came and found the tomb empty. And so naturally the resurrection itself came to be dated on the third day. And it's simply an idiom to pick up the Jonah story that Jesus, like Jonah, was in the belly or was in the ground for three days and three nights, shouldn't be pressed for literality. It's an idiom. Um, the use of the third day motif in the Old Testament is a theologically significant motif. Uh, when you look at how that phrase is used in the Old Testament again and again, it's on the third day that God delivers Israel from distress. The third day is the day of God's deliverance and victory. And so calling the um, date of the resurrection on the third day is a way of saying this is God's day of deliverance uh, and victory. Uh, most of the people or people want evidence to believe in Jesus Christ. Thomas was one of them. He wanted evidence to believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus answered him and told him, Blessed are those who do not see and yet have believed. Could you elaborate on the people who come to Christ through evidence? And then the final beatitude of Jesus Christ is, Blessed are those who do not see and yet believe. Okay. Uh, you know, what is, yeah. what is the blessedness in those who have not seen and yet believed? And, All right. and make How that comparison. How do we understand this passage where... Thomas refuses to believe, so Jesus appears to Thomas uh, and says, don't be doubting, put forth your finger and feel my wounds, put your, forth your hand and feel my side, and Thomas doesn't do it then, he just falls on the floor and says, my Lord and my God, and Jesus then says, do you believe because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Is this somehow depreciating the value of evidence and saying that it's better to believe by blind faith without evidence? I don't think that that's a proper understanding of the passage. What Thomas refused to do was to believe the apostolic testimony to the resurrection of Jesus. The other apostles had said to him, we have seen the Lord, and Thomas refused to believe the apostolic witness to Jesus, but demanded that he himself be able to see the risen Lord. And I think what Jesus is saying, blessed are those who do believe the apostolic witness, but aren't demanding that I appear to them at every generation in history, to every individual who's ever born, but rather they believe on the basis of the eyewitness testimony that the apostles gave. And so that's why after that blessing on Thomas, it goes on to say, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So John is emphasizing the sufficiency of the apostolic testimony that he delivers to the resurrection of Jesus, which Thomas doubted wrongfully and we shouldn't be like Thomas. We should not demand that Jesus appear to me in my bedroom, 
uh, but that we should believe the apostolic eyewitness testimony to this event. We're going to have two more questions and then we'll be done. So Nancy, okay. why don't you go and then run. Yeah, good morning and thank morning. you. Um, I've been um, kind of a bystander witness to a long-standing um, chatter on Facebook over the question of whether or not Christians and Muslims worship the same God. And I've yet to hear a good biblical answer to that question. So right. thanks for your response. This has become hugely controversial. Last year, Wheaton College, my alma mater, dismissed one of its faculty members because she said that Muslims and Christians uh, worship the same God. And she was not able to defend her position, apparently, or explain it adequately, theologically, for the college to feel that they could keep her on the staff. Well, this brought down on the college enormous bad press and heaps of abuse. Even many um, Christian theologians say that the college was wrong, that Muslims and Christians do worship the same God, um, and that it, it, it was incorrect what the college did. Now, I have addressed this issue in one of my questions of the week on the website, probably about a month or two ago. So if you go to the, the website, look at the questions of the week for about a month or two ago, there's one on do Muslims and Christians worship the same God. And Without wanting to get too complicated, let me say that the way that question is phrased raises all sorts of difficult philosophical questions about what it means to refer to the same thing. Because we can refer to something under a false description. For example, I could say, uh, that man in the corner drinking the martini is um, my uncle. But it turns out that he wasn't drinking a martini, it was water. And yet, I, I am referring to the same person under a false description. And so the claim is, well, maybe Muslims are worshiping the same God, but under a false description of who God is. And that raises in all sorts of philosophical problems of what it means to refer to the same thing and how do you successfully refer. I think the question is better reworded by saying, is the concept of God in Islam the same as the concept of God in Christianity? Do we have the same understanding of God? And there I argued that they are worlds apart, that the concept of God in Islam and Christianity is very, very different. And one of the principal ways in which they are different is that the Muslim concept of God, I believe, is morally defective. It is a morally defective vision of who God is. As the greatest conceivable being, a morally perfect being, God must be all-loving. And this is exactly what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God loves sinners, his love is impartial, it is universal, it is unconditional. And this is a world of difference from the God of the Quran. According to the Quran, God does not love sinners. He does not love unbelievers. He is an enemy to unbelievers. God in the Quran only loves those who first love him so that his love rises no higher than the sort of love that Jesus said tax collectors and sinners exhibit. They love those who love them, and that's the kind of love that the God of the Quran exhibits. So the Quran assures us of God's love for the God-fearing and the good doers, but he has no love for sinners and unbelievers. The Quran says that God does not love the very people that John 3.16 says God loves so much that he sent his only son to die for them. While we were yet enemies, Christ died for us. So this is a, a huge difference between the God of the Quran and the God of the Bible. The, the Heavenly Father revealed by Jesus 
loves sinners, loves unbelievers, wants them to come to him. His love is universal, impartial, uh, and unconditional love. But the God of the Quran, his love is partial, it is selective, and um, it has to be earned. It is conditional. Only those who earn it will receive it. So this is a vastly different conception of God. So I would agree with those who say that the God of Muhammad is not the God of Jesus Christ. He's not the God of the Bible. These are, it, it, in fact, I would say that the God of the Quran is a defamation of the Heavenly Father revealed by Jesus. Actually, following up on uh, about God being a God of love, um, the scriptures say that, you know, there is no greater love than a man lay down his life for his friend. And yet there are many documented instances where non-believers, especially during time of war, a buddy will fall on a right. grenade or something like that, give up his life for his friend. And yet, as a non-believer, um, how does one answer uh, a, a person that says, how can this loving God uh, send this individual to hell if he's, no. not, if he's a non-believer? Yeah. Let me say something about that question before I answer it that's kind of interesting. I've been studying lately the doctrine of the atonement, and this has been a very rich study, the idea that Jesus died for us, as the New Testament says. And what some of the authors or commentators point out is that this was actually a very widespread motif in the ancient world. The idea of dying in the place of someone else because of your loyalty to a friend or your devotion to uh, your husband, uh, you were willing to give up your life in the place of another. One of the most famous examples of this in ancient Greek literature is Alcestis, a wife who was willing to die in the place of her husband so that he could continue to live and exert his proper reign and, and, and so forth. Um, and she was held up as an example of nobility and courage uh, in ancient Greek literature because of her willingness to die in the place of her husband. And some commentators I've read says they think this is actually what Paul has in mind. Uh, when he talks about, um, uh, for a good man, one might die, and for a righteous, or one might dare even to die for a righteous man. He may be, she, he, they, they say she, uh, that, that Paul may be thinking of Alcestis and this case in, in the ancient world. So it may well be the case that this idea of dying in the place of someone else is a motif that is very prominent in the ancient world and one to which the gospel writers and Paul appeal to show how Jesus was willing to die in our place, but even greater in that he died not for a good man or a righteous man, but while we were enemies of God, he died for us. And that is unparalleled in the ancient world, that someone would give his life not for a good man or a righteous man, but for an ignoble man, an enemy. So that just kind of underlines a little bit of atonement theology with respect to Christ dying in our place. And as agonizing again emotionally as it is to think that someone who would exhibit such great love as to die for another person could be separated from God forever, I think that what we have to say is that no one can earn salvation by works. That it is impossible to earn salvation. It is only by God's grace that when God judges the totality of one's life, if you irrevocably reject Christ out of your life, then you repulse the grace of God and you fall back on his justice. And as we said earlier, you know where you stand there. So even though the unbeliever may do this act of tremendous courage and good, it isn't as though that merits eternal life. If he is rejecting Christ, 
He is rejecting God's gracious provision for sin. He is rejecting the one who has died in his place and therefore choosing to have to die himself. Um, And that isn't unjust on God's part because this is what every one of us really deserves. Grace, salvation is by grace and not by works. Well, thank you very much for your time, for coming out early this morning. I've enjoyed being with you.